So I'm going to share my screen. It says, yes. Um, So I've prepared a very quick slideshow. Um, right. Um, so the talk is about artists thriving and um, it made me think about a comment that we've had um, quite recently from an, an employee who described their experience of working at Ord as through this concept of warmth. And um, it was a really obviously very nice thing to hear, but also, um, it sort of catapulted myself and um, my colleague Sarah to actually sort of embark on an R&D project. Um, I do think that as Art Gallery, ever since we started in 2012, these, these terms I've put here, warmth, care, support and empathy have been part of our identity as an organization. But um, we, I think if 2020 had anybody anything, it's that you can never rest on your Ever sort of feel confident you have to kind of keep um, being curious and keep um, wanting to learn so we thought well let's make the most of this second lockdown and something just fell down and actually embark on a you know process of sort of look you know how do we do this what warmth and can support mean um, from an organizational point of view so that's what I wanted to talk about today um, and I think especially as an antis, antithesis to capitalism, where, um, you know, it's probably quite radical to sort of talk of, about support and empathy from an organizational point of view and to sort of say, well, it's, about a, it's not a competition, but actually um, supporting each other in the industry, supporting artists, supporting communities can be, you know, a win-win. Um, and I've put there that it's a work in progress, not because I want to apologize for any shortcomings, but because I feel like um, when we're talking about these kind of topics, we need to open ourselves up to criticism um, because only then we can really be transparent. So um, that's the idea is that this is um, a work in progress forever, I guess. Um, so, um, one way we do support uh, artists is through representation. I think it's, um, you know, not to be underestimated what representation can mean to people and how much there's a sort of, um, the artists we work with become role models for younger generations and how um, it can really change how people understand and see the arts industry. Um, we tend to work with artists at really crucial times in their career where they are going from uh, a, a sort of being an emergent artist to sort of the next stages. I mean, I'm obviously generalizing a little bit, but there tends to be very little provision for artists, especially black and, black and brown artists at that stage in their career. Um, and so we don't just support them with exhibition opportunities, but also anything where they might, their skills might still be developing, like you know, writing a funding bid or uh, actual tech behind putting up a show, professional development training, so that kind of thing. Another thing that I think is really important is around trusting artists. So that's with money and also with what they want to do. Um, and so that trust has never backfired for us at all. On the contrary, I feel like all artists, and I think Raj is an, a really good example of this as well, to just really make the most of what is essentially a small budget. You know, I, I realize that what we offer artists will always be a smaller budget than larger organizations, you know, pretty understandably, although that's a whole other conversation happening right now as well around paying artists. Um, But yes, so giving agency and freedom to artists, I think is really, really important when we're talking about support. Um, making space for artists. So there's definitely really strong plans for us to move away from programming and handing over the, um, the space for others to fill. And um, so producers, curators, artists, 
um, at all stages of the development. And I've put Alia here. <laughs> I don't think she's here, but I'm sure she would agree that she's someone to challenge. And I think it's really important that people challenge organizations at all levels, at all stages. Um, So then access, of course, is a really important one. Um, access is a really big buzzword that's sort of used all the time. And just to unpick that a little bit, um, so there's access in what is actually programmed, what's actually put in the walls, um, but also in the language used when talking about exhibitions, talking about artists, and um, the, the language used on the wall, online, etc. The methods that are used um, to speak to people, to welcome people in the space. Um, I mentioned paying people properly. And then also, Raju mentioned about um, working with the community, um, actually co-designing events uh, with the community. Uh, so um, rather than us being a gatekeeper who kind of does the funding bid and then gets the money and then sort of goes, okay, you can do this and this and this with it. There's this feeling of there is a much richer experience for everyone involved if we can do this in a more cooperative way. Um, physical access. So Raju briefly mentioned the space. We moved to this building last year and um, in terms of physical access to the space, things have really massively improved. It's still a very old building. So anything in terms of like, for example, a disabled lift is always an add-on and it's never going to be as, um, you know, it's never going to be ideal case scenario, but it's a big improvement. Um, but yes, um, there's other things that come with it um, that Raju mentioned around the community that has used this building since the seventies for community events. So weddings, funerals, baby showers, um, before lockdown happened here every weekend. Um, and then of course staff. Um, sorry, I know Leslie's here. Sorry, Leslie. Um, I think there's a really important um, thing to be said for the leadership of an organization and um, making sure that there's always progression routes for people to get to leadership. Um, we have been talking about self-management for a long time, so non-hierarchical structures. Um, succession planning is also something we've been looking into. And yeah, so I think in order to have an equitable work environment, there's a feeling of, so that starts, that, that starts at recruitment level and goes all the way to succession planning and beyond and board level. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Thanks, Josie. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to add to that to just say that, you know, bringing this, you know, being approached to do a performance and then me saying, no, I want to do this, um, the show that kind of platforms many, many different creatives. Um, I also to, to strategize to think about, you know, other ways of generating income with the budget, um, you know, and being realistic about that. So you're yeah, producing the publication and getting that locally printed you know, and, and getting that support from the local local printer as well. You know, um, not many organizations or institutions would, would allow that, right? So there's been a lot of flexibility, but most of it has come down to relationship, right? Relationship building and having a relationship with, with the artists and the, 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 the organization, right? It's so key to how spaces function. Um, you know, and I think this thing about being being honest and, and it be, about it being a, a process or a progress is also so crucial, right? It's like we learn from each other and we grow. Um, I'm also doing mentorships um, for a, a space called Jupiter Woods that, that in London where they've just kind of stepped back now and are doing this mentorship program to try and improve their, um, their space and how they're going to function in future as well. Um, so I'm very much interested in kind of like, this, yeah, I'm interested in my practice and, and curating, but I'm also interested in, in the spaces that we situate our, our creative <laughs> endeavors as well, right? So that becomes so important. And I think I have become very disillusioned and very frustrated with the art world and, and rethinking how I want to function within it um, or, or not, right? So yeah, so that's kind of 
wanted to give a background because it's so important about you know all hosting this and, and it's important that we get we kind of get that insight um, and so often you don't hear about the, these kind of insights about how these spaces function or work you know their ethos um, so yeah let's move on um, to speak to Yabba and uh, Saba and Yaz um, so Saba I kind of saw your work I'm going to sh uh, screen share it now I think I first came to your work um, at a show. Sorry, I just can't do two things at once. Um, oh, how do I get in here? Ah, here. So I came to your work through, um, it was a piece about being, uh, this piece, um, Choice, which was, Okay. okay. Yeah. I think this was it was in in Whitechapel, right? In Brick Lane. It was in a gallery space there. I can't remember the name of it. I don't know if you can remember that. Um, it was in Truman. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I want to say Truman Brewery. Yeah. Uh, it was around that area. Yeah. Exactly. And it was around the beauty of being British Asian, right? That was the kind of the theme yeah. of the show. And I remember seeing your work, and in, in, it's displayed here. And that's how it was displayed. Um, and I remember I didn't particularly like the show, I have to say. Um, I didn't, none of the other works, I didn't really feel like they spoke to me, but, but yours really stood out. And I remember, um, yeah, just feeling like it was having this com complex, nuanced conversation, right, about, about being South Asian, about being Muslim, about, about culture. Um, and I really appreciate that. So that's kind of how I came to your work. I think that was a long time ago. It was 2017, maybe? Yeah, it was 2017. Okay. Um, was but, back. Yeah, so it was a while back, but we hadn't connected. Um, but then I saw this piece, uh, no, not this piece, the Motherhood um, series as well. Um, yeah, so okay. it was kind of this scene about the relationship, between, a complex relationship between the mother and daughter. Um, so yeah, this is kind of how I came to your work. And um, then I started to follow you and see what you were up to. Um, and then I approached you because I just felt like this is, this is a kind of a voice that I wanted to get yeah, these conversations around these complex conversations around family structures, family relationships, culture, um, being in the diaspora and how we connect to that or, or, or reject it. And, and, and yeah, the, the, the kind of the complexity around that. Um, Yaz, I kind of met you before I came to what you do and your practice. I think we met in some workshops that we were running for Collective Creativity. We met, at, I think, a talk that Raisa was giving at the, um, um, what's the space called, that old colonial space, <laughs> textiles gallery, I'm not going to mention it. Um, but we, we kind of met and passing at different events and, 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 and through the workshops that that we were running through Collective Creativity, which is an arts collective that I'm also part of. And so we had really good interactions and I felt like we were able to dialogue and have, um, yeah, that, that kind of relationship before I came to what you were doing. And then again, I similarly, I, I checked out what you were up to um, and I saw that you were very much in, or I kind of got the sense anyway through our conversations and through the workshops that you're very much interested in thinking about yeah, where art is situated, spaces, um, a lot of your work is kind of in libraries um, and in public spaces and, and involving everyday public. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why I also wanted Yaz to be involved in the responding to the exhibition rather than being involved in like putting a piece of work in it, but actually having this critical kind of engagement with um, the exhibition. And so Yaz, again, with Art Gallery, I said, I want Yaz to be this artist in residence and to come and use the space. So Yaz is, 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 is doing that right now. Um, and so, yeah, that's another way that Art kind of been, have been really open to kind of opening the space to, to, to allow Yaz to do that. Um, so I don't want to introduce your bio, so I would rather that you, um, speak for yourself. I'm going to stop sharing screen now so that if you want to share something you can. Um, but yeah, it will be nice, Saba. Um, maybe you can speak, um, yeah, maybe introduce yourself and you can speak to 
your your practice your your whatever you creatively produce and yeah what what you do and why and how i guess that would be really nice yeah start us off. okay cool um hi everyone i'm saba just oh there you go there is an echo isn't there oh okay raji has just one. muted their mic so i think that was the issue there yeah okay awesome um yeah so i'm saba um i um it's really nice raju i didn't know that you'd seen the boba exhibition that's really interesting um yeah so um when raju saw that piece um that was before i had signed up to a publishing deal to um turn my comics into a graphic novel which is what i'm doing right now so i think my biggest most consumptive project um, that's taking all my time and energy and resources um, is the graphic novel and um, the piece that Raju saw and if anyone else saw it in, back in 2017 um, is also going to be um, is one of the chapters um, in the graphic novel um, but at that time it was a really interesting time for me because it was before I'd signed up to anything and my art was purely for me and I loved it. And it was literally like my relationship with my art. And for me, um, my practice is very, I guess it's very personal. It's very self-reflective. It's very much about experiences that I've had with my family or with social structures, with um, different cultural stru structures, with, um, uh, different industries. So I um, trained in architecture and spent pretty much most of my teens, uh, most of my teens, most of my twenties um, in a very kind of like um, trying to assimilate and trying to trying to fit in and trying to work um, within the construction industry. Um, so for me, going into the arts was very much like a reaction to architecture and it was a, it was an antidote and it was like, healing and medicinal and very much about me like suddenly just being able to be myself for myself um, and that was very much the starting point for my art practice um, what what that that choice chapter was very much that as well um, I spent about three or four months like drafting and editing and re-editing like what ultimately ended up being like I think about seven or eight pages in total um, so I think for me, what's really interesting, the question around thriving um, personally at the moment is this, this transition from something that was so personal and so raw and so just for myself and my own um, sort of cathartic kind of, you know, kind of processing things to suddenly like having a contract, trying to find funding, working towards a budget, um, working towards a, a, a time frame, and then having like, a kind of like production hat on with it which is completely different to what it was at the beginning and just this kind of morphing from one state to the other and you know I don't know like I don't know how I feel about that it was something so precious and so like you know like a savior to me um, from architecture and then it suddenly starting to take like another form which I think you guys like so this is my first year of being a full-time um, art practitioner so I, I feel like I'm still like a baby at it um, so I think that's a new thing for me and I'm just kind of grappling with it and that's me right now thanks so much Saba that's awesome um, yes if you do want to do the same that would be great to hear from you as well yeah happy to hi everyone nice to see everyone here uh, so I'm an artist curator I kind of thought that I would go into education first of all. So I trained to be a teacher and did kind of retail work and things like that. But art's always been in the background for me. So my mom was very interested in the arts, although she was a homemaker, um, first and foremost, looking after children, she was always doing art in the background and went to Goldsmiths as a mature student. And she's actually finishing her, her degree this year, which is amazing. Um, so, but I was taken as a kind of 10 year old into Goldsmiths as an institution. And I remember being, you know, my mom, I remember my mom saying to me, you know, Yaz, you're the only brown person here, you know? Um, so that was a kind of unique insight, I guess, into my introduction to the mainstream arts because art's always been in my house. And I really do believe that everyone has art in their home. 
um, you know, whether it be carpets or um, pictures on walls, um, the way that you put your family photos up um, along the staircase. I think everyone has art in their home and this kind of mainstream art practice is something that I had to be introduced to and I had to be um, sort of welcomed into as well, welcomed into the fold. Um, yeah, so my practice is incredibly varied. If you go onto my website, uh, you, can, you can kind of see the, the variety of stuff I do. And I, I think that is because I will make art out of anything, what, whatever I find. So at the moment I'm working on found canvas. You'd be surprised at the amount of old canvas people throw out on the street, uh, but also kind of film as well, like uh, analog film, quite interested in that. Um, yeah, that's about me. I mean, I'm based in Birmingham at the moment. I'm working for an art gallery in Birmingham and I'm originally from North London, but I'd call Birmingham my forever home now. And I have found community here and I feel like I've been really welcome, welcomed. Um, I, I did spend some time in London within the art scene and, um, you know, I found Birmingham to be uh, a lot smaller and therefore a lot more welcoming. That's me. Thanks, Yaz. Really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, Josie, I think has just dropped the links for both Sabah's and Yaz's website. So if you want to check out more what they're doing, but obviously they're part of the show, the recipes for the show as well. So you, you can see what, what they're up to with that as well. Um, so I'm just going to kind of share a little bit about my, my journey kind of to art as well. Um, I'm in my 40s, so <laughs> you know, it was a long time ago that I went to art school. Um, I kind of, yeah, had a had an upbringing with a single parent, single mother who was also creative, but mostly with kind of food and cooking. Um, and so I grew up around a lot of kind of food and kitchens and, and, and all of that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I grew up. And I went to art school because I was failing in all my other subjects. And it was the only thing, the only kind of good, decent grade I had when I left um, high school um, and I didn't need um, a grade for it. I just needed a portfolio to kind of go to art school. Um, it was a very small art college. It wasn't even a university um, and it was free at that time, right? I graduated in 2000. Um, so it was a completely different demographic compared to now because I teach in art schools now and it's, re it's very different to kind of the, the, the demographic people school school fees being 9,000 um, so it was a time where there was a lot of working class um, people I was one of the only people of color in my art school because it was in Herefordshire actually um, and it was a very white town um, so again I felt this alienation I came to art school feeling like this was a place for me and this is what I was good at and then I kind of left feeling a bit disillusioned um, so I left I didn't I didn't pursue arts um, actually, I went into teaching and I did more kind of creative workshops um, within the arts and kind of it was around this time of like multiculturalism. Um, so there was a lot of programming. It was labor, government. It was a lot of programming around um, multiculturalism and multilingualism. Um, my aunt was is a very key figure in kind of working with multilingualism within the educational system. So, so I had that kind of relationship and contact. Um, so I kind of got involved in, in, in teaching. Um, more in kind of community spaces. I also was coming out as queer and trans, so I was very much involved in queer and trans um, community spaces and, and organizing. So in kind of kind of queer anarchist spotted kind of spaces where we had more agency around doing things on our own terms and organizing and squatting was still legal. So it was possible to kind of create, curate and create your own space, right? Um, and so as part of that, there was like kitchens, um, I was part of kind of Women's Anarchist Nuisance Cafe, which changed to Women's uh, Autonomous Nuisance Cafe, um, other queer cafe projects. Um, I got more and more interested in food. Um, I ended up training for a year um, to, as a pastry chef. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I also had this kind of community kind of cooking um, from, my, from my own culture, from my mother, but also from from the training, uh, from the queer and, and trans spaces that I was a part of. Um, and then I kind of found it very difficult as a queer and trans person to um, find work in general employment. Um, and I was really struggling. I was trying to change my legal papers my, to my, match my gender, going through a, a gender transition um, and was doing painting and decorating and also some creative workshops on the side. 
Um, and I managed to, or I decided then to go back into um, education. So I decided to do an MA in, in fine art um, and I did that at Goldsmiths, but I dropped out um, because it wasn't for me and it was just really, really pretentious and, and awful actually. Um, and yeah, and, and, and so on. But basically I came more into kind of fine art practice, came more into kind of the art world. Um, yeah, I, there's, there's many reasons as to why I think that happened, but I think it's also about the art world kind of really commodifying specific identities as well within kind of queer and trans and people of color kind of um, communities as well. But also I just felt very limited um, in, in my world in terms of what kind of employment I could do, right? Um, I feel like I've been successful in some ways in the art world. In other ways, I felt very alienated by it. Um, I don't feel like I want to necessarily be situating my work in, in, in an industry that's based on capitalism and, and colonialism and, and, and yeah, those kind of foundations. So more recently, I've had more privilege and more resources and more opportunities to, to teach within those systems and to teach, try to reach out to other students um, who are like-minded, a lot of people of color students and trans and queer who um, yeah, need that kind of support, but also to kind of really challenge um, these institutional spaces, whether they're in education or in the art world. Um, and so I'm trying to do things differently with this kind of recipes for resistance um, show and with the other kind of my, my other art practices. Um, but yeah, that's a lot to say, summarize, but I am 40, so there's been a lot more trajectory kind of get through. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've spoken a little bit, Saba and Yaz, about kind of how art connects to everyday life. I think we've both put that in. Um, I kind of wanted to also speak to yeah, how we survive as artists making art well. So yeah, I, I've also spoken a little bit about this in terms of struggling with that and trying to find my own kind of networks and art collectives and so on to do that. Um, but it would be good to, good to hear from you. Um, yeah, what that positionality is, this kind of within art institutions or doing your own thing within within community spaces or outside of that um, and how it impacts what you do, you know. Um, so maybe Yaz, yes, you can, do you wanna? Yeah. Yeah, so I was thinking about this question, what we need to thrive and I sort of figured out or kind of settled on three different sort of sections. So access, which has already been talked about by Josie a bit, safety, and education. And so I thought I'd just do a quick summary of what I mean by those things. So I'm going off my own personal experience in terms of access. I went to a lot of free workshops um, when I was a teenager. Uh, I went, you know, I had the internet. I was privileged in that way that I was able to kind of access these, these ways of thinking and these, these knowledges. It's not just about being able to have the money or necessarily it's it's about being, being able to step through the doors first of all like physically access it um but also those knowledges that you know what is it that makes a good picture what is it that um what is it that is hanging on the walls in the first place i think having that access is really important um and the, the second thing safety i think being in a space that values you as a human being i think is really really important and having um a safe space in terms of physically it's safe and also um, mentally it's it's safe as well for people with various uh, mental health issues as well and, and physical uh, disabilities for example um and i think a lot of these arts institutions are not that they may have a you know a disabled ramp that, that people with wheelchairs and um, can can use, but are they safe when you step inside of them? Not really. And I think the conversation around um, museums, especially in in the UK, it's it's all pointing to the fact that people just don't feel safe in those spaces because they are just showing that you can just steal ideas, you can steal physical pieces of artwork as well. Um, and the third is education, and I don't necessarily mean education in terms of art school, but having, knowing your own worth and your own sort of, your own experience, you can rely on that and it is valuable. 
um, and I think it's really important when we're talking about we, what do we need to thrive, is just to make it really clear that I'm not talking about uh, property developers who have taken it up an interest in art. I'm not talking about um, the directors of art galleries that already own their own house and um, you know are in a, a safe position. Um, and I'm not talking about CEOs and, and directors of companies either because these people, they are thriving in this, in this society. This society allows them to thrive through exploitation of the working class specifically. And I think when we talk about we as artists, I think I, I kind of want to expand that because access, safety and education, specifically class consciousness with education, is important for, you know, the liberation of, of all working class people. Because at the moment, the society is allowing certain people to thrive and allowing greed to thrive and allowing these things to thrive. But it's not allowing um, just an overall human well-being which is what i think we need as human beings to thrive so um when i i, I guess with everything that i'm going to say tonight and and just to keep that in mind that this we that i'm talking about is very specifically for people who are the working class and and are exploited um because it's more important than ever that as we're understanding this and we're getting more class conscious that we are starting to feel upset and angry, but also we're feeling like we have to um, kind of attain this level of greediness and this level of grabbing everything that we can because that is survival. But maybe through this conversation and maybe through more research and more discussion, we can find alternative models to ensure our well-being and ensure our, ensure our safety, really. Thanks, yeah, that's a really good point around kind of thriving and who we're speaking to and like, yeah, positionality within that. Um, yeah, Sabo, it would be great to hear from you. I really liked your, your kind of comments around vulnerability and, and power, um, interdependence um, and intimacy as well. If you can, yeah, maybe speak, speak whatever you want to share, but also speak to those things. Yeah, I think just jumping off of Yaz's um, a really thorough breakdown. Yes, that was amazing. I was like, oh my god, it's so it's just so clear and structured. I love it. Um, <laughs> and mine is going to be anything but. Oh. Um, I think for me, um, it is all connected to well-being, really, and it, it is it's similar to what you're saying. Um, in in that, I think where I'm finding myself, I'm in this kind of like cycle of production, and you know, like ticking the boxes and jumping through the hoops right now to to prove myself um, and not I'm not really able to like really focus on the quality of the art itself which is something that I'm really wary of um, and I think it it's actually strangely it's like loosely connected to Raju I'm sorry to keep bringing it back to the Bobo exhibition um, what you didn't like about the other pieces of work and what you did like about my work which is something that has been a big internal conversation within my head around the role of um, black and brown artists within the arts um, industry and the role that we end up playing of taking the diversity box um, and really having to sort of like perform like little you know sort of just like kind of little things I was going to say something else but no um little dolls I guess um and I th and I think this is where I don't know if it's fair to say or not but I know um the white pube did this incredible article that summed it all up for me which was the problem with diaspora art um and then I think off the back of that they did another one that was looking at the um the problem with representation in general um and just how where I think in order to get onto that wheel of you know uh, kind of like being recognized as an artist and as a practitioner and I think it kind of is kind of connected to like funding as well right because when you're applying for funding like when I got the publishing deal the advance was like barely anything like I had to get funding for it 
and suddenly I was like put into this system of like well how do you tick the boxes and when is the deadline and who are you like you know like suddenly all of these things were put into place that I hadn't really that, that didn't really feed my art beforehand but suddenly I had to really fit my output into these very structured um kind of um results and quantifiable results um thank you Raju yes it's it's a it's a brilliant article because I think it sums it up in a really a lot better than what I'm trying to do but I think um in a way that's that's the overarching problem that I'm seeing that's within institutes but also outside of institutes just art in general like in order to just survive, in order to get the funding, in order to sort of be able to live off of the work because you need the time to be able to do the work and the time is what the funding is facilitating. So I don't know, like it's just a bit of a vicious loop for me. And I think because I'm still so, I'm just gonna keep saying that I'm new at it because it's, it's a nice excuse as well. well that, that, <laughs> um, comes into, that comes into safety as well, financial security yeah. and being yeah. able to take risks and something that Josie said at the start, being adaptable to think something like COVID, which was, you know, sideswiped us all. You know, how are you supposed to be adaptable if you don't have that security? Um, and so I think that that fits into that safety and, and, and being safe as being really important as well. Yeah, totally. Sabra, awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't worry about what, yeah. I think your 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 sharing your sharing is is really great. Um, I would love to hear more about what you spoke about interdependence. Um, do you remember the kind of looking to kind of yes of yes that was all you know what when I sent that to you I was like oh yes I must freshen up on on those concepts so I remember and then I forgot I completely forgot so um I, so I'm going to try to just loosely describe what what so I've been reading lots lots of you know sort of um mental health concepts and you know well-being things as well around just my own personal um um i think it's it's channeling towards the graphic novel but um essentially it was something that i recently read where you've got um social structures that are very individualistic you've got social structures that are very collectivist and from a psychological point of view and behavioral point of view, I don't want to go too into it because obviously I'm not a psychologist um, and it's obviously still, you know, like I'm soaking it up as well. Um, they both end up sort of, um, sort of kind of encouraging certain kind of toxic behaviors, hierarchical behaviors, including the collectivist um, models especially within migrant communities because they're within an individualistic community they've then microcosmed within themselves but then they've got this collectivist ideal but often it doesn't um manifest in that way it ends up becoming this kind of twisted version of uh of you know a community working for each other um essentially that coupled with patriarchy as well you often have like a top-down male figure that everybody has to kind of respond to um, and the book that I was reading was really talking about interdependence as the as the solution to to the two um, extremes of the individualistic and the collectivist. And at the stage that I'm at, I'm going to be completely honest. That's as far as I'm at with it. I'm not able to um, really go into it too far um, for now. But then maybe when I do, I can share it. I, I often share on Instagram as well. So um, yeah. I'm, that's a lame response at the moment, but no, that's, that's my understanding of it in a nutshell right now as we speak. Thanks for your response, Saba. Um, yeah, there was more kind of that I want to speak to you about family structures and, and you spoke about intimacy as well, but I think, well, I'll, let's, I'll bring that in um, at another point. Um, but I, I can say, I guess on my part, um, that I, my strategy has also been I guess collectivity and having trying to have collective um, organizing, collective conversation, um, to kind of have your support systems within that, that collective network. Um, and that has been probably what's what changed or where I went from kind of feeling very disillusioned and disempowered um, to kind of being able to do more with with the resources that and build resources so through collective creativity which is an arts collective that that i'm part of with Evan Ifikoya, uh, Raisa Kabir and Really Low 
Um, so we were really kind of challenging institutional racism, really challenging the, the lack of the archive. Um, you know, Josie spoke about representation and, and you know, it's this thing of like, we know that there's artists like us out there, but we can't always connect to them for, because they're not, they're not there in the archive or they're not, um, you know, not, not even unarchived in the sense that we're not able to have those relationships with those artists. Um, or those histories. Um, so yeah, through collectivity um, that, and, and kind of calling out, um, I think the White Pube do this really well and have a bigger platform for that. Um, because again, it can be a very difficult process to do, but like, collect, like collectively calling out um, institutions and spaces, um, as well as kind of building relationship building with, with people who you feel are willing to do that work. Um, I think for me, it's also been, about a politics of refusal, like, and, and, and I'm kind of, this point that you mentioned, Sabah, around assimilation, I think that that's exactly why I didn't particularly like that exhibition, because it had this assimilation kind of narrative. And there, that is a big problem within, within the UK around South Asian community. Um, I feel like that's a, that's a conversation to have within the South Asian community, so I'm not gonna speak about that so much here now, but I think there is an issue around assimilationism and complicity. Um, and so I think for me, I'm also, aware of recognizing my position within that because yes I'm facing marginalization and, and possibly oppression within these kind of structures but I'm also part of them and I'm also perpetuating them in some way right so for me it's also being about questioning my positionality and thinking about what I can do within that and negotiating and navigating that right because it is it is a it's a process right um, and we're not always going to get it right either. Um, so for me, it's been about resource. It's about economics and resources for me now. My practice is really thinking about those things and how I can use those in a way to kind of be more ethical or, or platform people that I feel are really important who are not getting that visibility or um, share the resources around or, you know, and resources are not just financial. It's, it's, it's much more than that as well, right? It's about networks, connections. It's about, um, yeah many 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 things i think there's not enough time to maybe go into all of that um but i think so, so for me it's about trying to be just clever i guess it's about playing playing the system to a certain extent but making sure that i don't compromise myself or my 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 practice or my ethics or anyone else's in in, in the same way um i can share something that is a um a resource that i put together um Oh, it's really annoying when the bar comes right. Uh, yeah. I uh, hear. So I kind of put together this kind of do's and don'ts for like kind of socially engaged practice um, while recognizing that there's a lot of performativity. I mean, Josie also mentioned this earlier about everyone wants to be seen to be, to have the right politics and there's a perform, performance of politics. But I put together this kind of do or don't. Um, it's online. I don't know actually if it's online yet, but it, but it will be online soon. So just kind of what you do and what you don't in terms of maintaining integrity, not compromising your your, your ethics for fame, careerism, kudos status. Um, and so yeah, for me it's also about raising awareness, raising because I think you know with some of my practice in terms of like undervalued energetic economy um, as well is really about unpacking the the systems and structures that we're a part of and how we're entangled within them right um and putting that out as a resource i realize has allowed people to kind of see themselves in it being, being able to then position themselves being able to, to to see how they want to navigate that for themselves um so for me it's also about resources and i'm thinking about a lot about that as an educator as well um in terms of what resources i can i can put up um, um yeah that people can also benefit from. Um, so yeah, maybe we can, I think Yaz, I wanted to hear specifically about Birmingham, about the, the spaces that you're, you know, the community and art spaces that you're involved in there and what you, what, what's what been happening for you. You mentioned this pledge by the Black Creative Workforce. Um, and I think, yeah, that would be really good to kind of localize this to Birmingham and, and hear more about that. Um, Saba, I still want to hear about kind of, um, you know, thinking through spaces, it's not just art spaces. As you've raised, it's also about culture. It's also about the cultures that we grew up in that, that, that shaped with how we came, you know, to be ourselves and, and, and embrace um, 
embrace or not embrace our, our, our creative practices. So yeah, I would like to hear more about that kind of that, the family structures and, and particularly intimacy and how you learned to kind of survive within that. Um, so yeah, maybe Yaz, do you want to go and then Sabi can come in? Yeah, so I guess situating myself within the Birmingham art scene, it's very small, quite DIY in a lot of ways. A lot of spaces are set up by artists for artists. We have kind of a couple of big art galleries, but you know, they give local people some nice opportunities to, to work and to engage with arts and the artists. So um, I think there has been this process, but to get to any point in the arts, you have to be let in. There's no way that you are able to just, you know, do it yourself it just doesn't make any sense you have to go through interviews you have to um you know do things in that way i i feel um obviously there are kind of alternative and anarchist ways um in brum as well um but yeah i think the majority of, of things are still that sort of old school of literally people have to open doors for you to to get into spaces um, in terms of the, yeah, so the Black Creative Workforce are what they're calling themselves. Um, and it's um, a load of different people from universities, from academia, from all different um, um, kind of industries, specifically focused on what the arts need to pledge to do. So organize, what organisations need to pledge to do. And they are asking every single organization to sign up to every single one of their actions um and so i, I really do we could share it um if we wanted to josie or raju i don't mind who um do you want me to search for it or Jos josie cool um, yeah so it's it's really interesting um um just kind of seeing what they're asking for basically and it is they are big asks, you know, they're asking creative directors to step down, you know, and uh, I think it's really, really necessary when the same people have been in the, the job for 20, 30, 40 years at these, some of these institutions, you know, how do they expect to be, to be interesting and relevant to, to the people around them. Um, so yeah, this is specifically for the West Midlands. I think they've just they're just asking organizations in the West Midlands to sign this at the moment. Um, they obviously they use the phrase black, they don't use this term of political blackness. And they actually say that terms like people of colour and um, BAME are act actively dangerous and, and harmful. And I guess it kind of falls into what Raju's one of the, the don'ts was kind of using the jargon and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, focusing on kind of uh, Black African, Caribbean, et cetera, heritage. And I just thought it was really interesting. It, yeah, the play, it, I definitely recommend just reading what they are asking of the art institutions. And this has been in the works for a good year now. Um, holding space, listening, reflecting, moving forward. And I think what's been interesting as well is seeing arts institutions release these anti-racism documents and, and kind of pledges, anti-racism pledges. And, oh, these are all the people that, that are uh, working on this at the moment. So you've got some big names in there. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's interesting kind of comparing this to some arts organizations, anti-racism pledges. It's not enough to just say, look, we'll have 50% of our workforce as oh. people of colour. Okay. Oh. Oh, sorry. I thought that was. I thought that was someone else talking. Um, yeah. So that's that. Um, yeah. In terms of the Birmingham, in terms of where I'm working at the moment, I'm working for a gallery called Eastside Projects, and um, yeah, it's it's been incredibly interesting because in some ways they're very very different to arts organisations um, in in this country specifically set up by artists, they got a very specific pot of money um, when they first opened around 20 years ago that just doesn't exist anymore. So they have quite a special relationship with the university, but they don't really have to answer to the university. Um, so they're in quite a unique position, but even 
though that was quite radical at that time, now they're sort of looking forward and saying, how are we going to make this relevant to, to the artists today? You know, And I think a lot of it is they admit that they are quite stuck in their ways and they admit that they are part of the problem. You know, That's something that they've actually said. But they've also refused to step down as directors, which I have directly asked them to do. Um, you know, they they are still working with organisations that morally I don't agree with. Um, for example, Lendlease, who build prisons around the world. Um, you know, it's interesting how how people working in the arts justify these sorts of relationships to say, well, we we get the money from them and maybe we'll have some sort of impact, but ultimately you're just the name on the portfolio, you know, for, for that property developer that, um, or, you know, that, that company that's bought a lot of Birmingham city centre to gentrify. Um, I think gentrification is a really interesting topic as well to, to discuss. I think that's really stifling it, us as working class people being able to thrive as someone who was, you know, priced out of London. You know, my whole family was priced out of London and had to move. So, um, yeah, it's just working within the arts is really, really tricky. First, you have to be let in. Second, you have to deal with the rigmarole of everything that goes on. For example, I was working at Tate as an intern in 2018 when the Sackler scandal broke out, <laughs> which meant that. Um, members of staff were actually saying should we use the escalators that were bought with blood money like is that something morally that we can do <laughs> you know that's not a safe environment for a human being to have to make those decisions every day you know mentally on my health that it just was awful so now I'm working with Eastside and, and having to again make those moral decisions like Rashi said their positionality within the arts world you have to start thinking where what role do i play in this what i had people before i started working at east side coming up to me and saying oh my gosh do you know that they're working with this builder of prisons right so mm -hmm. i had to I had to think about that i had to really and i don't know what the answer is you know what, what the strategies this, are there is this burden though isn't there this is what i feel like as me as an artist i feel like there's a certain amount of politics and activism i do want to do and want to get involved in but there's also a burden of that that, that the burden of that right? burden of having to do that right as artists as creatives um and i think some of that i refuse and some of that i'm like why why are we having to to do that work right um, and those who should be, like you said, the ones who are thriving and not necessarily doing doing that work. So I think for me, I've also learned that as an artist, I've also have to have this burden of this of this activism. Um, Saba, maybe you can. I, I'm aware I want to kind of bring it to kind of um, questions and responses from from everyone who's also here with us, witnessing and sharing the space. So Saba, can you maybe speak to kind of yeah the family structures and 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 intimacy and kind of your lived experience and, and what you shared with me earlier, because that was really, really awesome. Um, so yeah, that would be really good. And then we'll move on to kind of questions and responses. Yeah, I have a link and it's the gentrification link to Yaz's um, another awesome um, insight into what's been going on with Birmingham and, and the black um, creative workforce. Um, so the gentrification, I think, um, obviously in East London as well. Um, there's lots of movement of people. Um, sorry, I'm shuffling on my sofa. Um, I think the thing that I'm thinking in response to that is, um, I'm, I'm bringing it a little bit more current to what's been going on with COVID. Um, and just um, to be fair, like I've kind of lost track of all of the rhetoric and I'm a bit exhausted from it. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit outdated now, I guess. It's back when lockdown was still fresh and we were all watching the news every single day. Um, but there was a real language around, um, you know, um, black and brown people being um, a lot more susceptible to it, um, whether that's because they're key workers or whether um, they have health problems because of the food that they eat or whether they're living in multi-generational households. There was a whole 
kind of um, conversation and rhetoric around lifestyles and the lifestyles being the reason why um, people are statistically, uh, you know, black and brown bodies are statistically more prone to the virus, which for me, I found really horrific and shocking. And in response to that, I did a piece that um, kind of, it was within our architectural practice and it was looking at the urban planning of cities and how groups of people are grouped together and often air pollution is a problem and clean streets is a problem and space is a problem, green space is a problem and that often has a knock-on effect um, and nobody really talks about that. So I think there has been, I think there has been more conversation around it, there's been more opening up of that, um, but I think for me that's just systematic, sym symptomatic of um, the blame rhetoric and really pointing the finger on our cultures and our lifestyles, um, which then just kind of leads me to um, multi-generational living and what's really exciting that for me, I've seen in my community during COVID and during lockdown is that actually um, having close communities together and having family structures within whether it's intergenerational or multi-generational generational, just supporting each other socially, taking care of each other, cooking for each other, um, sharing resources with each other and just kind of avoiding this like loneliness and um, isolation that COVID is um, connected to for me has just been like, why are we not singing about this? Why is everyone not adopting this kind of like approach where you're able to like kind of collectivize and um, connect with each other. Um, and I think just personally for me, um, I recently was thinking back to some of my childhood days where one of my uncles was a really huge figure in my life. And um, it's been quite an interesting kind of flashback, like looking back to when I was growing up in the 90s in, in, in in East London and having a, you know, like lots of different generations within one household and supporting each other financially and socially. Um, and just what that meant um, in terms of um, my access to different types of love, different types of um, relationships, um, you know, masculine role models that I weren't really there for me in other, in, in, my, in my dad figure, I guess. Um, so I think for me, there's, there's a lot of, I guess it's, you know, there's a lot of value and there's a lot of um, scope for growth and for reinterpretation of some of those things that are just a bit bastardized, I guess, and tainted. Um, and um, I think, um, where am I going with this? I think that's, that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> Um, I guess we could probably, a lot of that stuff feeds into the work that I was doing with Josie. I don't know whether it's the right time to show um, that work. Yeah, you're nodding. Well, I mean, so let's yeah, it would, it would be good to, yeah, it would, because in the ethos of your, actually your piece in the um, exhibition around kind of the road to resilience and reparenting, you know, I really like that reparenting section because it, 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 it rewrites, it recontextualizes the, the whole narrative, right? of how, what, what we actually would need or how it could look like, right? So yeah, the last question was around what kind of spaces and conditions do we need? So that really speaks to that. But yeah, also following from that, you've done this project with Josie. So yeah, feel free to share that. And then Yaz, I'm gonna ask you the same thing around, yeah, what kind of spaces and conditions you think we need? I know you're already, you're already doing that within your curation as well. So these aren't things that we have to really, you know, imagine their, 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 their reality as well. Um, great, Sabah. If you want to, are you going to screen? Share? Um, I think Josie's going to screen share for me because I'm on the phone. Um, so this is just um, just off of the back of, you know, kind of COVID and um, just the intensity of all of that stuff. Um, uh, Josie uh, asked me to do some well-being messages for the community in Birmingham, um, and they are. 
um, initially intended as the six of them and they were initially intended to be aimed towards elderly people within the community that may be self-isolating whether they're on their own or they don't really have access to a lot of support. Um, there's groups that are going to food banks as well and so they're very much on the sort of um, you know kind of marginalized front where they really need a lot of support and um, could do with just you know nice reminders of well-being um, so that was the the brief I probably described it really badly but <laughs> here we are um, and what ensued for me was really just um, it was about making it really personal again and um, reflecting on my own experiences and my own reflections on on my family's like tenderness and um, I guess their own vulnerabilities when it comes to to COVID um, and just the kinds of conversations that we were having on a on a daily on a on a daily um, basis I guess um, so these six messages here really condense that for me um, it was also really important for me to draw them as South Asian as well um, and that was really interesting and just going back to what um, Josie was saying about building trust um, I think that was a really big part of our relationship whilst um, I was working on this and Josie was um, kind of feeding back. Um, also one other thing to mention as well, this was also co-created as well, so we worked with local community groups um, from the mosque and I think there was another charity as well, a local women's group, um, where we got their experiences around their time around Covid and, and how they were engaging with their families. So it was really like a condensing of all of these conversations. Um, so the first one was hydrate your soul, this one is connect to your um, connect to your loved ones. Um, this is the back of the postcard. So they're going to be printed. Um, open your space. Um, kind of like riffing off of ventilation and, you know, getting open air in, but at the same time, just feeling the wind on your skin and um, kind of, you know, um, taking it back to the basics, I guess. Um, Thanks, Sabra. I think we're running we're running a bit low on time, so I'm just going to cut you. Even though I don't, really don't want to go cut for you, yeah, I'm gonna yeah, have yeah, to yeah, move no, to yes, yes, just yeah. for the sake of yes, time. Yes, let's move to yes. Um, let's but move thank you so much for sharing, and you know, hopefully people can can get hold of those as well. Have a look, have a further look. Definitely, it's a great example of how work can be this collective project and it kind of takes your your ego as an artist out of it because you're actually doing it for the well-being of others so i think it's a, it's great I'm really looking forward to the the finished finished work um i guess i wanted to talk more about what you said Saba, about the like this multi-generational thing and the importance for multi-generational conversations and discussions i think that's what recipes for resistance exhibition really discusses as well this idea of bringing different voices in and the act of bringing voices together will make a more fair society so i think having like sava said about this having this like one patriarchy that everyone has to answer to or actually listening to the children and not using this victorian ideal that children should be um, seen and not heard and listening to people you know elders as well um, women elders and non-binary elders and things um, I think that's really important so yeah I just wanted to say that first of all that that's what I found with this exhibition bringing different artists voices and Rashu actually saying well let's let's give let's hand the conversation over let's have Sabah's work I don't know whose decision it was, but let's have Sabah's work that people can actually draw their own comics and write their own comics. Um, just to say that I did a video today with, at the gallery, so there will be a, vid, a virtual tour sort of thing um, that's going to be available to see soon on the gallery's website. And really it's just a personal response, me responding personally to, to the artwork, but hopefully you'll get some really nice shots and you'll be able to sort of engage with that. Um, in terms of yeah spaces and how I guess my own practice reflects how we my sort of resistance to waiting for a gallery space to say okay you can curate an exhibition here now I literally wanted my first exhibition I curated I had some friends who I really like their work 
and I knew that there was a library. Most libraries have a community room or have some sort of space where there is a white wall. So I approached Jubilee Library in Brighton, which has these big windows at the front and they use them for exhibition space. And at that time it was like 150 quid to rent out for the week. So I saved up and I was like, right, I'm gonna, going to curate an exhibition. I'm gonna put my, my friend's artworks in the, on the windows. And so that was my first, my first exhibition and I wanted it because I knew a lot of communities um, community groups specifically were using the spaces and the the tables in front of the windows uh, behind the windows sorry to engage with so making sure they were kind of transparent on two-sided so people could interact with them as well and then my second gallery my second exhibition again was in a library a ward end gallery uh, a ward end sorry ward end library they have kind of a community space but they have um, some white walls and, and sort of hooks that you can hang things on so that was my second exhibition and then the third was um, in someone's house it was um, um, someone called Mal and Alex who are they love collecting art and um, they're really amazing people they they host artists in their space to to kind of talk and hang their own work so I actually covered their kitchen cabinets with um, my collected material um, I guess to sort of I don't know if democratize is the right word but allow everyone that came from all different parts of my my extended network you know it was musicians that I know local musicians that I know to uh, my family to people that I'd met through anti-fascist work to um, to friends from the queer community all came together and they were able to literally take you know go through my huge bags of things um so that was th those are just what i've done so far to try and resist i guess the the having to wait for someone to tell me now you can curate an exhibition saying Thanks, that yes. i will be curating an <laughs> exhibition <laughs> i will be curating an exhibition in a gallery at east side next year so look forward to that yeah as i'm sure you're going to bring you. something really really good to it um yeah so, yeah thank you so much um i'm not going to I'm not going to share, but I'm, I think it's evident in kind of the way that I practice and in recipes for resistance. I'm also doing re remedies for resistance, similar to Saba, thinking through this time of COVID, um, but also beyond that. Um, but yeah, you know, thank you so much for sharing. I think we're going to open it up now to, um, yeah, to whoever's around right now who wants to kind of chip in if you have any comments you're welcome to drop them in the chat box if you don't want to read them out but if you want to you know speak then please put your video on and maybe raise your hand or, or use the gesture um, reaction so that we can I think we can open up to maybe a couple of questions because we are we can run over a little bit but I think I want to respect the time um, so yeah are there any questions or comments responses anything we've discussed ah so Soraya ah Soraya it's good to good to hear you uh thank you for all your amazing work that's great anyone else ah Neha yeah. Hi, that was great. Lovely to hear. Um, oh, I know, like, obviously, Yas was saying that um, they thought it would be quite um, bleak, but I really don't think so, because I think it's quite a positive that we're able to have spaces that we can have these conversations in. Um, but I kind of just wanted to add on to what Asaba was saying about um, how our communities um, have had this, like, really bad press on like COVID and everything and I think there was no like sort of well not much that I said anyway about like epigenetics and like what our communities have been through and like the reasons why um, we're more likely to get ill and how we're more likely to have mental health problems and general illnesses and like this kind of topic um, about what do we need to thrive is like extra important right now um, so yeah I just wanted to add to that um, but this is great. Thank you. Thanks, Neha. 
Yeah, it's almost like, you know, just to get to the point of thriving, there's so much to unpack. And the fact that those conversations aren't even there and you have to really dig deep to like start to surface the like source of things. It's it's hard work for sure. But we yeah, and this is this is also this is also why I wanted to do recipes for resistance because and to try and have this intergenerational kind of an inter inter um, ethnic inter religion kind of conversation as well because I think there's so much around kind of yeah there's trauma there's legacy there's 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 a lot that we need to also be having these conversations with each other and, and learning and unpacking with each other as well on this um covid has kind of hit us so you know some of those conversations have been limited but it's also migrated wider in some senses um yeah the audio that i recorded with my aunt who's like maybe nearly 90 if that's in the exhibition you know she was really pleased that it's you know gone so gone you know it's she's had this public kind of you know profile in this way um, and never even, um, she, yeah, she's really humble. She just thought, well, it's just my personal story. What kind of value and worth does it have? And, you know, this is the, this is the thing is that a lot of people within community don't feel like we talked about value and worth as artists, but yeah, as people like that, we don't feel that our stories are, are so important and powerful. Um, so yeah, lots of great comments in the, in the, um, in the chat about the, the session. Yeah. I mean, it's a big subject. There's a lot to unpack for sure. And I just really wanted to, to start this conversation or have this conversation with, with you both. Um, but yeah, if there's any more, Oh, Sam, Sam, you have, I can't, I couldn't see. Oh yeah. Sorry. I haven't got my video on, but I just okay. wanted to say thank you so much um for all the um inspirational useful relatable talk that all of you have done today um just like to say a big thank you to all of you great thank you so much sam appreciate that um aya benami hopefully i said that right um has asked thank you everyone for sharing your wisdom and experiences i'm wondering whether any of you practice any other healing modalities besides art to tap into healing and cope with lockdown and feelings of confinement. I think Saba, you mentioned something in your chat. Um, yeah, mine is is a lot more standard. It's it's not an alternative. So I'm I'm doing therapy um, at the moment, um, and I'm just trying to have a bit more of a physical practice as well, um, which just involves YouTube videos of yoga that I follow. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the the therapy has been huge, huge, um, and really, um, really grounding for me. Um, unfortunately, I am in a position where I'm going to have to review it because of finances. Mm -hmm. Not fun. Wah, wah. But Therapies are thriving it. with COVID, I think, um, at this yeah. moment. Um, yeah, as I don't know if you have any. I, mine is food. Mine is always food in, in many ways and kind of feeding myself and feeding other people um but also it's been art but doing art for my, for myself you know and not necessarily having to put it out there or like sh showcase it or share it um just kind of being creative um, for myself uh, yes yeah i think i'll share something from um a therapy session that i went to um i was in therapy for a year definitely recommend it to anyone um not being too hard on yourself and actually saying to yourself, I'm doing okay, I'm doing fine, you know, even if I'm cold into a heap in bed and not eaten anything and not <laughs> washed or not, you know, whatever it is that depression or whatever it is does to you, you know, you have to tell yourself that you're doing fine and you're doing okay and um, don't be too harsh on yourself. I think that's really, really important. Mm. Um, yeah. I've seen some practitioners like, you know, yoga practitioners or, or kind of more body movement practitioners have also been offering things online, which has been really useful. I think things like this, I mean, this has been amazing and there's, there's really great comments, but in general, this whole Zoom kind of industrial complex and the fatigue around kind of Zoom sessions and being online, um, it's, it's a nice break to kind of have like some more body movement and, and kind of sharing that online. So that's been really great. Um, and I've been tapping into that as well. Um, so yeah, I think in this time thinking through, you know, the government 
is making or taking risks or making bad judgments based on economy you know i feel like we really need to kind of reconsider our economies and what what kind of um what we're sharing with each other right now you know um it's really important and i think i feel someone's written that they feel really optimistic i also feel optimistic in some ways covid has been really difficult but i think the mutual aid and community support i think it's become very evident that it's necessary and i think people are being more active around that um so yeah oh yeah so Ayobemi's, uh benoni's has answered thank you everyone i practice yoga too very important to decolonize that practice as well. Thank you for sharing this, Sarah Rajin. Yes. Um, there's two practitioners. My, my cousin, um, Nadia Galani, is, speaks on yoga and decolonizing and is really speaking around, around that subject. And also um, Jill Nashara. Um, so I can share those two in, in, the, in the chat as well. Can I also, I, oh, sorry. I was just gonna add, add one more thing to what I do. I sing a lot. <laughs> so just sing to your favorite song. I love that. I love doing that. Releases a lot of endorphins. Awesome. Um, I was going to say, are we able to like copy the chat? Because I've not been able to look at any of the chat. Uh, yeah, yes, cool. we will. I'll download that chat. Um, is that you, yeah. Sabah? Yeah, that was me. Yep. Um, I'm trying to find these yoga. Oh, ah, yeah, here we go. We yes, have one the more. would be amazing. That'd be amazing. To see any, that. One more question as well, say, um, from Sam, any tips that you can give um, on how um, they can get around to looking at their physical fitness again? I feel like it's one that I'm neglecting, unfortunately. I'm feeling like that as well, not walking anywhere. You know, I usually walk to work. Or, um, but um, at the moment, I'm walking to the park. I'm finding things that are open. There's like a community kitchen. Um, uh, on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, it's like a 10 minute, 15 minute walk. So just, um, just doing that really. My housemate is really gym crazy. So he's bought like a load of weights and things to do. Thank you so much. Um, okay. If there's any last questions or comments or responses, we've got, two, we've got two minutes. Um, so we actually kept the time quite well, so that's quite good. But yeah, it would be nice to hear from you all. There's one one last question in the chat from Annalise. Ah. ah, which artists or work you're most inspired by and that makes you most hopeful for the future? Ooh, I have quite a few actually, I think. Um, Can I share a project? <laughs> yeah, go for um, it. So I was looking yesterday at Oh, I can't remember where it was in the US, but they've just, the people have voted for an alternative for Confederate statues. And the proposal is to melt down the Confederate statues and use the bronze to represent um, those um, embarked on two slave ships from Africa. Um, and so each, each metal plaque is gonna have holes in it to represent each person. They're going to have like 80,000 of these plaques down a long boulevard and light them from the bottom so it's going to like illuminate the entire walkway um and i thought that was pretty spectacular awesome um i'll speak on a project um texter queen who's based in australia but has been spending a lot of time in the uk recently has just put out a children's um coloring book oh, it's not just for children but it's it's aimed at for kind of learning your a cabs so around kind of white supremacy and, and this coloring book which is um, they, sorry, they are an illustrator and are also showing, I think they have a, a mural at Mimosa House Gallery on the outside. Um, so Texas Queen is, I'll post the website. Sabo, any mentions? You know what, my brain has frozen. Like I can't, I'm, I'm just listening to you guys. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. That sounds awesome. And my own brain is just frozen right now. It's probably the time. No worries. I can't been, think of anything. It's been an hour and a half. Thank. <laughs> um, I mean, I would say everyone in the exhibition, um, people who are in the, the publication as well. Um, if, I know people can't make it to the exhibition right now, but hopefully once lockdown's lifted, or you know, check out the online material. We've tried to put it put out as much as we can without doing you know doing it for the sake of it, basically. Um, 
So yeah, and we look forward to Yaslan's um, responses. You've already done a pre kind of pre response, which was food is not scarce, um, which is a flyer that's, that's in response to um, yeah the government's decisions around school meals. Um, and maybe as you want to say, say something about it, but yeah. Yeah, I can quickly just discuss that. It was written basically in a response to food insecurity and food scarcity. And, um, you know, I've been through times when I have had absolutely zero money in my account and I've had to walk down the street and see um, fruits and vegetables and shops full of food um, and not been able to eat, basically. Um, and just thinking of children in this country that are having to do the same. Uh, we'll have to do the same you know i think the, i think the government have actually done the u-turn now yeah they have yeah it's quite interesting but at the time you know that was it just showed uh, and highlighted i guess the greed of the politicians and, and people in power really so yeah it was it was that i spoke about a european folk tale about stone soup which is a folk tale about how a traveler goes to a um a, a, a town where he where they don't know anyone and they have to trick the townsfolk to be able to eat um, and I quite like that mischief. Yeah. Awesome thanks Yas. Um, so there's a question about the catalogue. We, we, I'm not sure if we have a catalogue but we, we definitely have the publications which kind of they're, they're part of the exhibition. This publication is also part of the exhibition. It's, it's a work in itself I guess but it also there's other artists involved in this um, but I don't know if we have a handout or something for the gallery. But you can check everything online in terms of what's um, what everyone's up to. Um, but yeah, these publications are available to buy. They only five pounds um, for a donation, but postage and packaging is about two quid. Um, and yeah, th those are available to buy um, via. Or maybe maybe we can put that up on the website or something. I think it's on my website on rajuage.com. So you, if you want to find out where to purchase that. Um, and yeah, you know, that helps. This is what I'm using to fund um, the project and pay artists um, to create, to grow the project and to build the project. So um, if you want to do that, that would be great. Um, thank you so much for everyone today. Thanks for everyone who's listening and, and witnessing as well and for your input and comments. I will make sure to download the chat. Um, and um, yeah, this is the, the last of the, the events, right, Josie? We've got a, a workshop, which is kind of a private, a close with the, with the local community. Um, but yeah, hopefully there's more, there's more conversation and, and more to come. Thank My you video so is going to come out soon as well, so of the gallery tour. Oh yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, that's a way that people will be able to, um, to, to view that. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all. Bye.